Triangulation is key, and it's triangulation or combining elements, both physical and programmatic, to attract more people, to extend their stay, to extend their experience, to make it richer. So this is an example from Ryan Park. I'm sure you've heard of it. And they do it really um, in a smart way, partially because it's not such a big part. So in, in a way, they're doing it doing it because they have to. But they've combined a carousel, a children's reading room, and a cafe, all in a very small area, and it works really well. And two of these activities, the carousel and the children's reading room, are free, and for the cafe, of course, you, you have to pay for whatever you're drinking, but the seating is free. So a lot of it is also about having things that people can engage in without feeling that they have to buy something or pay for something. And we can't do it alone. We need all the help we can get, and it's really the people in the community who can make it happen. So, um, as for, we see ourselves really as facilitators of the process. And oh, I'm sorry, this is a little hard to read. I'm going to walk you through this, and I'm going to provide this presentation as a PowerPoint. So later on, um, you can get that from the folks at Via, so you don't have to write frantically in your notebooks. <laughs> You can also find this on our website, and I'm going to provide all this information. But really, the way we see it and the way we practice it is about um, placemaking being this somewhat circular process. I know it looks like a funnel here, but it's really a circle. And we start with the place, and we start with identifying the stakeholders and the people who are engaged in it, or need to be engaged in it, or who have a say, or should have a say. So it's kind of a broader net of identifying who is part of the space and who should be part of the space and who is interested in the space. So it's not just about, if it's a residential area, talking just to the residents. There is a variety of other people that need to be part of the process, so we call them stakeholders. They have different stakes in the process. And then we engage them in a, a whole different a series of workshops, meetings, a way to um, get them to be part of the process. Yesterday, uh, I demonstrated one of our tools. We have a variety of different tools, but the whole goal of it is really to build this vision for the place together and to have a buy-in from everybody. And ideally, what we want is everybody to contribute something, whatever their means are. And sometimes that works, and sometimes, um, you know, well, some people do a lot more than other people, but that, that, that's how those cooperative processes work. And our goal at the end of the day is to build a longer term plan, but also to do quick interventions and small scale improvements to keep the ball rolling. One of the things we see over and over again, and it doesn't matter if it's in the United States or in Europe or somewhere else, is that big plans take a long time to implement. Planners around the world have become more and more attuned to community planning. There's all these tools and ways to communicate with people, but it takes two years, three years, sometimes five years just to complete the plan. And then there is a bunch more years to implement. So by the time all of this is in the ground, who knows, that maybe like 10 years later, and my needs as a person from the community may be completely different. You know, my kids are out, out of school and now they're in college and I'm going to be retiring. It's a completely different world. So our goal with the short-term implementation, which sometimes we call lighter, quicker, cheaper, although it's not always that cheap, <laughs> um, is really to begin those changes right away and to keep both people's faith that change is possible but also to support their use and give them a reason to come back and be part of this place as early as possible. And then at the bottom of the funnel, you see ongoing reevaluation and more improvement. So we feel that it's, it's a process and you keep coming back to it. And um, we just need to review and revise and hopefully keep being involved and work on the better management, programming, and, and even design tweaks to the space. So, um, we also use something we call the power of 10, and it's really a way for us to scale the process of making a great place into 
um, connecting it into making a great destination, and then making um, a city great through a series of those great destinations. So when you think about it, and again, I'm sorry, it's a little pale, it's hard to see, but when you, when you think about one place, one plaza, or one park, it's really about, are there 10 things to do there, and maybe even 10 plus things to do. And oftentimes, places come short. You know, you come up with one, two, two, three, maybe four things to do, but you need ten and more. And by things to do, it can be very, very simple, like, I can sit, I can eat food, I can look at the fountain, I can look at the flowers, I can plant the flower. You know, you, you, you can imagine what that would look like. And then scaling that to the level of destination and then up to the level of the region and think of places as connected. So, and as offering a connection of activities and things for people to do. So if you, if you work in a smaller community, you may feel like, well, how does that apply to us? We can't really have 10 things to do and let alone 10 different places. But they can be very, very small. And it's really a way of scaling up or down um, your experience expectations and how you think about place making. So I'm going to show you one case study and then I'm going to take time and see um, how we're doing. And I have a lot of examples and that's why um, we're going to run, th run through a couple of them and, and maybe afterwards I can talk to you if you're still interested. So this is work that we did um, the last three years in downtown Detroit. You don't have to worry about this map but it's showing you downtown and then all the other destinations around it. But we started with a square. And actually when we started, it looked like that. It was just an intersection. There wasn't really a place there. And we started working on this place in 1998. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's been a while. And a vision was developed and really the goal of this project was to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the founding of Detroit and there were all these like city celebrations and suddenly it became clear that this is not just about fixing a destination and it was about creating a real place so you can see like the bubble drawing there of what this place may look like and they built it, oops, sorry, they built it, this is 2004 so a square right downtown, they completely changed the streets, a lot of new development and buildings came in because the space was there. What is more interesting is they opened in November, this is Detroit, it gets really cold, so they started with the Christmas tree and the ice skating rink and a whole bunch of winter activities. So this is 2004, we've been engaged with them for a long, long time. In 2012 we came back and re-engaged with downtown Detroit. We've done a lot of work in Detroit, but this was like 2012, and we were talking about this concept of the power of 10, and what are the 10 destinations, and essentially everybody felt like the southern part of the park, right by the monument, was not really doing much, it wasn't very active, and that connected space called Cadillac Square was really empty. So this is our 10 destination, actually we hit 12, ha ha. Um, you know, destinations with the, within those two spaces that are connected and what they could look like. And the idea for the, improving the southern square was actually um, to build a beach. And all of these conversations came from massive community engagement. We did workshops, we did, did surveys, we had a booth in their Christmas market. So we probably talked to like three to four thousand people in person. And then another, I don't know, maybe 5,000 contributed to the survey. So it was really a collective effort to come up with this. And they built the beach, and there it is, on the construction. And it has a beach bar, which is very important because that's what makes the beach sustainable. <laughs> Seriously, and this is what it is now. The most interesting thing about it, this is downtown Detroit. Not many people live there, let alone families. No one was really expecting kids. As soon as we put the sand down, kids appeared out of nowhere. And parents and people from the suburbs who hadn't been downtown in years came just for the sand. And what they were saying was, well, there's all these like water playgrounds and other things, but when you drive with a wet kid, it's not the same thing as when they played in the sands. 
So they're so successful that they have to in, um, they have to install a curfew for children after 9 p.m. There's so many kids in the sand, so they can actually have some drinks. The reason I'm bringing up the the bar is actually because the proceeds for the bar go for maintaining their beach. And um, what they do is, at the end of the summer, they take everything away, they dismantle the, the beach, uh, the, the little deck, they put away the fine sand, and then they use the base sand for the ice skating rink. Mm -hmm. And all of this costs them about $50,000 a year to put it together and take apart. But they say it's totally worth it because the bar makes a lot more and, and attracts all these people. But one thing, as you know, one bird doesn't make spring, one place doesn't make a downtown. So we continue to work with them on this place called Cadillac Square. So this is their food market. And um, they started with these like little huts and now they just have the trucks. And people from the office buildings are coming out and it was a tough negotiation because all the big office buildings have cafeterias where the food is subsidized. So on opening day, we had to negotiate for the cafeterias to be closed, so people would actually have to go outside and try the food that, I, that is outside. And now, of course, um, it's really, really packed with people, and it's completely changed what they, that place looks like. And of course, there's all the other activities. It's not just about the food and the drinks, as I was saying. And there's pit dog, and there's street basketball, and they've actually spilled outside of that area in other buildings and other businesses are kind of making their own contribution and extending this whole feeling of activity. Um, and they have dueling pianos and they're building these outside platforms. So this is really to tell you how the effort in one place can scale up to all of downtown. And downtown Detroit is now hip and famous and cool. Uh, but it really, it started with a lot of smaller things and sometimes something like the beach, and I'm not saying the beach, but something like it can really make a, a huge, huge difference. How am I doing on time? Alright, okay, one more then. So Harvard, fancy place, Harvard University, big deal. So we worked there in a space that um, was basically the border between Harvard and the community. And there is a big division, and their goal was really to create a community place. And we started with some small changes to their green, and it was a really big step for us, because, you know, the Harvard green has always been like that, and it's just empty, and you walk through it, and all of a sudden we put chairs and tables and games, and the students actually brought a petting zoo, um, for the kids, but actually the students were much more interested than the kids in the petting zoo. So now they have a whole program because they feel that everybody's so stressed and they need to relax. Um, we added some more whimsical furniture and, you know, people really connected to it. But this is the really interesting part. So this is really the boundary between the community and the university that starts right there behind the fence. In this space, it may be a little hard to see, is actually on top of a highway. So they cap the highway to create this plaza. And we just added a variety of elements and they program it intensively. Um, there's a little story about these benches that you see that are very sculptural and all the designers love them. I see them posted on Pinterest, uh, Pinterest all the time but they're actually really uncomfortable to sit on and that's why people are using the bean bags and they're putting the bean bags on top of the benches. So designers, huge respects to you, but like sit on it first. <laughs> you know, having a bench that costs $20,000 and you can't really sit on is, is a bit of a shame. You know? So it, it's all about being comfortable and, and really inviting people to be in the space. So they did, you know, fancy picnic tables and games and chess and all of that good stuff is happening. And what is more interesting is they actually do winter. Because guess what? It's Boston. They have winter. <coughs> so they do an ice skating rink and fire pits with marshmallows 
And the funniest thing about the five bits was it was a tough negotiation. They were so afraid that something's going to go wrong with the fire pit. So I don't think I have a photo of it, but next to each fire pit were like two fire extinguishers. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. Like the students and the people from the neighborhood are just going to set everything on fire. I'm not quite sure. But, um, and one of the things they did that was really fun, this is curling. So obviously not everybody is a, an accomplished ice skater, and they did something that is simpler and easier to do, and it's actually curling on plastic, that's not even ice. So they, they are kind of working on their program um, for the winter, and it's becoming more and more robust, and people from the neighborhood are actually coming to contribute and are part of it. So um, I will skip this. Sorry, close your eyes. I mean, it's, it's a good story, but we don't have that much time. And I will show you this. So, I know some of you work in very small communities. Not everybody can be Harvard and Detroit. So, this is some work that we did with an arts group in Camden. And it was in an empty waterfront site looking to um, Philadelphia, basically, across the Delaware River. Nothing in the site. These big tanks. So one of the things that we designed together was this idea of the night garden, Camden night garden. And one thing to remember is like, Camden is a very depressed community with serious um, problems and a lot of crime, and they were considering a very dangerous place. So who would come here at night? So part of the idea of the night garden is to make people feel like they own the place and they can, can be there outside safely and participate in things at night. This is their marching, the school marching band, which is a big deal and everybody has to be part of it. And they also have um, cheerleaders and it was like all the school kids were there. They had graffiti artists, something that Camden is very famous for. So they were part of the event and light art. And they built these like BMX ramps basically out of dirt on the site. And we were there with our little, um, you know, place making boards and talking to people and kind of driving them away from, from the fun to get more ideas and more input. But what, um, what was really interesting is that we also were working with social practice artists who were part of all these meetings and came up with their art projects for the space. And one of the projects, very surprising, I don't know how that came about, but it was really cool, was um, this artist, Catherine Sklavi, who developed a tablecloth, basically. You see her here sewing a tablecloth with people from the neighborhood, and they um, registered it in the Book of Guinness, and at the end of the summer, they had um, a community dinner, right there with the giant tablecloth, with a lot of other activities, and music, and basketball, and light graffiti, so um, it was really a way for them to reclaim their own part and start making some of these smaller change changes um, that we really would take a long time to accomplish if it was just, um, you know, everything had to be built and finished. So it, it's kind of a work in progress and they're continuing to work on it. So I, five minutes? All right, five minutes, one more. Um, this is a program that we worked on with a corporate funder. It's, an organization, uh, it's a corporation called Redbox. Basically, they rent uh, DVDs out of a box in the supermarket. And they wanted, they came to us and they're like, oh, we want to do movie nights and place making everywhere. And we're like, well, we don't know how that's going to work. And we connected with a group that works specifically with libraries. We put out a call for proposals. And we ended up doing about 50 events, and about 20 of them were about place making on a smaller scale, and the partners were all small town libraries. And these people were incredible. Some of them, you see the blue, uh, the red dots, they did just a movie night, and you can imagine what a movie night is. But some of them, like these folks, uh, Richland, South Carolina, they had a children's country music festival. So they hosted it outside, and you can see it's a very pretty photo. Everybody had fun, the kids were performing, there were games, but how did they do it? They covered their entire parking lot in AstroTurf. <coughs> and everybody loved it so much that they had to leave the AstroTurf on the parking lot for at least a month in the summer. 
and now they're basically um, completely redesigning the parking lot and ripping up half of it to have this permanent green space. So, and um, just so you can figure out what that is about, the funding that they received was literally $5,000 worth of stuff. They didn't even get a check, they got to fix certain things. So this is a library in a very small town in Massachusetts. They use their $5,000 grant to create a kayak rental. So with your library card, you can, create, you can rent the kayak. And this is their launch event. So, um, you know, they got some furniture. They built the little stand for the kayaks. So that's what the library is doing. This one, uh, they did a, a kite festival and they added some furniture to a local park that's actually not right at the library. So, the moral of the story is you can do it on a very small scale, even with like very little money, if you think a little bigger. And if you connect to those bigger anchors and supporters like the library, um, at least in the US, libraries are trying to reinvent themselves, and so are museums and cultural centers. So I know some of your earlier conversation yesterday, conversations yesterday were about community assets. All of these people need to be at the table because they probably already have the program that you can bring into a public space to begin your placemaking efforts. This is not the tail end. It's not about the kites or the red chairs, but it's the beginning of a process of thinking of the space in a different way. I think that was my cue, very dramatic. Thank you. <laughs> So check it out, we have a website, and we would love to see some of you in Vancouver. It's a fun place to be. <laughs> so placemakingweek.org is the website. All right. Questions? So um, that is one of our big goals, to use the experts 
as silent breakers as opposed to, oh, this is my thing and this is what I do and you can't tell me what to do. So it's, it's a pull and push and I'm a planner by training and an urban designer by training. We have in our team architects and landscape architects and transportation engineers, but we really rely on the people in the community and the stakeholders in the community who are already doing that. Okay. Another question, if I may. Do you have any anthropologists in your team? We Yes, we do. Actually, the founder of our organization, Fred Kent, is a geographer and an anthropologist, and we have uh, cultural anthropologists. And, um, I think the way anthropology works in the U.S. is a little different than um, the way it's being practiced here in Europe, but we definitely have a broader range of people. It's not just planners and designers. Thank you very much. So, last question. And, it, and I think we can take more questions yes, yes, during the break, too, outside. Can you come to the mic, please? I have a question just about, like, a lot of the activities tend to think of public space as a place to enjoy yourself, a place to have fun, a place for entertainment, a place to consume. And um, what do you, what would you, how would you react to the idea that public space should also be a place where you actually invest in it, contribute to it, and make something, or do something, or design something, or, you know, in a sense, rather than just that relationship of consuming with the users of public space, to become somehow co-creators of it. Uh, oh, I mean, definitely. You know, a lot of those small examples are really about people being part of making it. Um, we often talk about making it happen with other people, there's a lot of groups out there that are very invested in fabrication and community make days and community planting days and community construction days. Um, and, I, and I love those examples and I've worked on a lot of these projects. I think one of the challenges now is because this thing is becoming a big deal is to um, see it in a way that is not just about, oh, we're going to make some furniture out of pallets. Believe me, I've done that. It's not as easy as it looks. It actually takes a lot more time, and I'm sure you guys know that too, than you always expect. Um, but it's also about presenting it as a viable way of thinking and actually planning your community and not just something that you know community groups and people who plan do. Um, and I think it's also a way of bringing the profile of all the community, up the profile of all the community groups that are actually doing that work. So, in the U.S., and I see that in Europe, too, there's a big division of, like, oh, that's community work, and this is what us serious planners and designers and architects do. And, and that is our goal. We need to break that barrier and open it up to everyone.